Growing up, my brothers and I used to play basketball in the driveway, and no one expected that we'd <laughs> develop a career in athletics. <laughs> we simply played, right, not thinking about a career. Sports were simply fun. They were healthy, social. Sports were the kind of hobby that could enrich the rest of our lives. <clears throat> and the same is true for arts. Yet, when I played at science down by the creek, everyone expected that I'd become a scientist. I guess no one thought it was fun, or healthy, not social. Science wasn't seen as the kind of hobby that could enrich the rest of my life. Science was confined to the category of career. Kids that like science should grow up to be scientists. And that was a good thing, because without professional scientists, there'd be no discoveries. And I wanted to make discoveries, and so I became a professional scientist. But eventually I learned that everyone was a little right, but mostly wrong about those expectations. Science, of course, is a profession, but science is also a hobby. Science is also a hobby. And how that profession and the hobby interact is the topic of the conversation today because there's some long-standing stereotypes about science, that it's lofty, that it's separate from the rest of us. And that separateness exists because, unlike athletics and art, which take place in public view, science typically takes place out of sight, behind closed doors. With science, you have to choose which side of the door to be on, and you're either all in or you're out. And if you're all in, then you get the privilege and the responsibility to advance knowledge. You get to be special. But what if we end the stereotype of scientist as special by changing science in a fundamental way, by eliminating the door, by making it a collaboration between professional scientists and people who choose other careers, like you, and you, even you? What if science were visible and accessible? What would the world be like if science happened out in the open, every day, everywhere? If you saw a spider today, stand up so I can see you. If you saw a spider, stand. <laughs> OK, so stay standing. I want you to be joined by, if you saw an ant today, Stand and stay standing. If you saw, if you smelled exhaust from traffic fumes, used an app to record your sleep cycle or your heart rate, <laughs> were concerned about the quality of your tap water, if you used your phone to take a photo this week, then stand. <laughs> okay. So look around. All of you are curious, concerned, observant of your surroundings. Each of you have the makings of a citizen scientist. Yeah, be seated. To have a just and sustainable world, we need to adopt a new cultural norm in which being a responsible person on this planet means that we observe our surroundings with intention, like you do. And we share what we see, hear, smell, find. Right? That we report when we see hummingbirds return to our feeder. We monitor the streams that run through our local parks. We track the air quality in our schoolyards. That we and our devices become part of a network taking the pulse of the planet. And with it, a new type of scientist emerges. Not one that's separate from us, but one that ends the hierarchy. One who helps build and tend these networks. Ones that help us make sense of all that information so that the tiny everyday activities of ordinary people can be brought together to be forces of discovery. This type of science isn't about individual heroes gaining credit. It's about all of us gaining insight. This type of science is similar to democracy. Right? In democracy, 
We use the term citizen to refer to those who have rights and responsibilities to participate in a larger collective governance. We might petition and rally and engage deeply in a number of ways, but the core thing, the simplest action, is that we cast a vote. And our individual vote, it may feel insignificant, but cumulatively, it makes leadership change. And so with citizen scientists, that term is used to refer to people anywhere on this planet, of any nationality, living anywhere, who assert their rights and responsibilities to participate in collective inquiry, collective discoveries. And we might pose hypotheses or analyze results or engage deeply in a number of ways, but the core and the simplest thing we can do is to share data. And our individual data may feel insignificant, but collectively, it has the power to make discoveries that change the world. We know what democracy looks like. This is what citizen science looks like. It's, it is, citizen science is a movement that is challenging us to rethink how knowledge is made, who makes it, where that happens, and who it serves. Citizen science is about the power of crowds in which everyone does their small part instead of having to rely on the heroics of an individual, an Einstein. And even Einstein acknowledged, science is a wonderful thing, especially when one doesn't have to earn one's living at it. <laughs> and we aren't far from citizen science as a new cultural norm. It turns out the whole time I was becoming a professional scientist, citizen science was near me, but it didn't have a name, and, be, and it was hard to notice because it didn't fit the stereotype of scientist as special. Citizen science was nameless with monarch butterflies. When I was in the fifth grade, scientists had recently discovered that monarch butterflies migrate from the Midwest all the way to Mexico in the fall and return in the spring. And I daydreamed about what it would be like to be that special scientist to solve such a mystery. But it turns out that discovery was possible because of thousands of people who had been capturing and tagging monarchs for decades. And that first tagged monarch spotted in Mexico had been tagged by a school teacher in Minnesota with two of his teenage students. And people went on to continue to capture and tag monarchs and make more and more discoveries, including our knowledge today that this migratory population of monarchs is declining rapidly. Citizen science was nameless with bears. My first college job was a zoology internship studying bears in the mountains of North Carolina. And we would capture bears and tranquilize them like the one in this picture so that we could put radio collars on them and track their movements. And it was labor-intensive work. And it was helped out by hundreds of volunteers over the years who rotated in by the dozen for three weeks at a time coordinated by an organization called Earthwatch. And for me, as a budding scientist, this was a confusing time, right? Because on the one hand, it was affirming this idea, this stereotype that scientists were special, because here were people who were paying to spend their vacations doing the hard work of science. But on the other hand, here were these people that I could see had the same dedication and commitment as the professional scientists. Citizen science was nameless with falcons. My second college internship was releasing peregrine falcons back into the wild after they had been bred in captivity. And we were doing this reintroduction because peregrine falcon populations had crashed from the use of the pesticide DDT, which thinned their eggshells. Well, scientists were able to figure out that DDT thinned their eggshells by comparing eggs with those that were collected a long time ago before the manufacturing of DDT. And those eggshells were thick. Well, non-professionals had collected those eggs and donated them to museums. Right? It used to be a hobby to collect beautiful wild bird eggs. And citizen science was nameless with songbirds. When I was in graduate school, British scientists discovered that songbirds were already laying their eggs earlier because of climate change. And in making the case for the Kyoto Protocol, 
the British government relied on that study to argue that, <laughs> that climate change wasn't some future problem, but that it was a now problem, an urgent problem, because it was already affecting life on Earth. And it made me proud to become a scientist. But I learned years later, when I interviewed the lead researcher for that study, for my book, Citizen Science, How Ordinary People Are Changing the Face of Discovery, that that entire data set of tens of thousands of nesting records was collected by bird watchers across England over decades. I learned of discovery after discovery that was possible because of citizen science volunteers. And yet it went unrecognized. And not only were we failing to recognize the valuable contributions of citizen scientists, we were failing to recognize the limits of scientists. And we can no longer ignore the fact that there are things that scientists will never, ever be able to discover alone. Citizen science has a name now, and its growth is inevitable. Because science has advanced in so many areas that to keep pushing some of those frontiers, scientists need to learn to collaborate, not just with each other, but with everyone. And that's how big discoveries have been made. The entire field of oceanography was born from citizen science, right? There was no way that a single scientist, no matter how special, could study something so vast. So in the 1800s, the field of oceanography was born from the coordinated efforts led by Matthew Fontaine Maury, who was in the Navy at the time, and sailors from 13 countries. And Maury crowdsourced their standardized observations that they collected while they sailed and assembled it together to make an increasingly comprehensive series of wind and current charts like this one. And these charts, they made sailing safer and faster for everyone. As one sailor wrote to Maori, until I took up your work, I had been traversing the ocean blindfolded. Citizen science can look like it's about volunteers in service to science, but it's really about making sure that science is serving people, helping humanity remove these blindfolds. Because we have, <laughs> we have lots of blindfolds still. And citizen science can help us <laughs> with those. So even with our own health and environment, we wear blindfolds. We learn from peregrine falcons that their eggs can tell a story about the ubiquity of DDT. So now I collaborate with citizen scientists in Sparrow Swap who are, are reviving the hobby of egg collecting. So and every egg is unique, and every egg tells a story. Because we spend, we spend millions now searching for cures of cancer, but relatively little to prevent cancer. And there are known cancer-causing contaminants in the environment. Wouldn't it be nice to know where they are? So we crowdsource for maps the way Maori did. We crowdsource for OpenStreetMap and Waze to help us navigate from point A to point B. So now we're trying to crowdsource for mapping contaminants in the environment. And we hope that the patterning and the color of these eggs might help us do that. And what's neat is when we bring together all these observations, we see huge diversity. And maybe eggs aren't your thing, <laughs> but how about warm and fuzzy things, <laughs> right? Because there's people all over the world who are setting out motion-sensitive cameras, right? And they're discovering mammals secretively living among them in their backyards, in their schoolyards, in their neighborhoods. And it's super exciting for the people who are, who are getting these observations. But what's really powerful is that they're willing to share. And so when those observations are brought together, then we can see patterns that would otherwise remain invisible. There's thousands of people who use low-cost rain gauges, and they share their catch, the amount of precipitation, with the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network daily. And here's this is showing the maximum precipitation each day across the country. And it's data like these that are more reliable for local forecasts than radar. And there's people 
who were sharing observations of ladybirds in their gardens. That's English for ladybugs in their backyards. Right? And they're sharing these with the UK Ladybird Survey. So here's a pattern of invasions of an exotic ladybird species into the UK in recent years. This is citizen scientists sharing what they see. This is citizen science taking the pulse of the planet. And so how do we move forward? How do we make citizen science the new norm, make it a household phrase? Well, to my scientist friends, I say scientist friends, let's start teaching our students, our future scientists, to be public scientists. And that's what we've started doing at North Carolina State University. We're teaching our graduate students to design and organize citizen science, to manage big data, to collaborate with the public. And if you are pursuing other careers, well, you can play at the soccer field. You can do art in the studio. But citizen science, you can do anywhere, anytime, as part of normal life, right? You can put a birdhouse in your backyard, next to a rain gauge, next to a sunflower that you watch for bees. You can record your dog's behavior. You can sample microbes in your shower head. And to make it easier for you to enter this world of citizen science, I helped build SciStarter.com. And Darlene Cavalier is the founder and director of SciStarter. And she's a citizen scientist. She's a former NBA cheerleader who enjoys science. And we've made SciStarter an aggregator of projects. Most, we have over 1,000 projects. And they're mostly hosted by universities, NGOs, federal agencies. And really, no matter what your interest, whether it's oceans, frogs, butterflies, squirrels, <laughs> coal ash, whatever it is, we can help you find a project that's right for you. And so and if you join via my landing page, then I can welcome you. And then I can also watch and help you as you launch into this amazingly varied world of citizen science opportunities. Because as we sail forward into the future, we're leaving a lot of problems in our wake. And so the good news is that science is fun. Science is healthy, <laughs> and it's social. It's a hobby that can enrich the rest of your life. And science as a hobby is more accessible and more in need of you now than ever before. So you can join this citizen science movement and help make it the new cultural norm. You can be special along with millions of others. Thank you.